Dan, you talked about self-control, and you talked about institutions that used to help us exercise it. I think it's also noticeable these days in our culture that there's a kind of self-control elite. There's a group of people who seem to exercise extreme self-control. They tend to be wealthy, well-educated, very fit. They have the time and the money to invest in that kind of self-control. That didn't used to be such a big divide in our society. What do you think are the institutions that you alluded to when you spoke earlier that could help all of us, not just the people wealthy enough to afford gym memberships and personal trainers? And what can we do to revive some of those institutions? Well, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think that th there is a kind of um, aristocracy of self-discipline, and um, I would advocate sort of rounding them up and exporting them or something, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, um, there, you'd have to wake up very early in the morning to do that, but I, I, I think that, um, I think that, um, you know, Richard Herrnstein once said that um, we think that if we create equality of opportunity and a, and, a, and a perfect meritocracy and so forth, that we'll get a very equal society. And he said, in fact, the opposite will happen. You know, people will be left to uh, achieve to the best of their abilities or sink or swim and so forth, and they will. And um, I think that, um, I'm going to say something very obvious, which is freedom can be very costly. It can be expensive. Choice can be very expensive. Herbert Simon told us that choice and search can be very expensive. And so it's important to have institutions and community and, and, and these kinds of forces and traditions and uh, rituals. Uh, I wrote a column recently about the usefulness of the cocktail hour, which enables you to, it, to have the pleasure of alcohol but, but puts boundaries around it. You know, you have to do it with someone else, someone you care about, who'll pay attention to you, who'll maybe, whose eyebrows will go up if you have one drink too many. Uh, uh, it, has an, it has an end built into it. And um, I, I think, un unfortunately, we've, um, we've individualized meals to a great extent. Um, we've uh, gone away from, you know, sitting down and having family meals. Uh, We've, uh, you know, the marketplace has, has worked its magic. I mean, the number of fast food restaurants in America has grown by something like fivefold in a generation, I mean, per capita, which is astonishing, really. So there's a whole bunch of forces here, technology, uh, both in the way foods are prepared and, and, um, and in, the, in the way we, can no, we, we no longer have to expend calories. Um, and so, you know, uh, we have a kind of a problem, and it's, it's spreading. It's not just unique to America. And I think that, that absent the kinds of cultural and social institutions that um, have always helped us to um, put boundaries around pleasure, um, you know, we're, we're probably in for some difficulties. I mean, the good news is freedom is a wonderful thing, and I'm the last one to want to reduce it or constrain it, but I think that people ought to seek ways to constrain themselves uh, through uh, 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 rituals and through uh, uh, traditions that, uh, that, that can allow pleasure to occur while keeping it within bounds. I guess it's not very helpful. Perhaps someday people, I imagine someday we'll just invent a pill, and that will be the end of the story. But, but for now, I think cultural forces are something we're going to have to depend upon. Well, that leads to a follow-up question when we start thinking about the role of the individual. If you had a pill that would cure obesity, what would be the new self-control vice? I mean, what would be the new vice that, as a culture, we would define as a new vice and pursue zealously with reality television shows and government-sponsored programs to get fit and tax credits for people who exercise every day, or quit smoking, because we are certainly headed for a society where certain behaviors will be rewarded and others punished. So I think of Ben Franklin in this context with his little checklist of virtues and yeah. how he'd focus on those. Is there even room for that in modern society or is that sort of wishful thinking? Um, Franklin, yes, Franklin had a wonderful spreadsheet for those who don't know when he put the, the vir he put 13 virtues down one side in the days of the week and he would make marks when he transgressed and you know, temperance of course was one of them and, there was chastity, and there were other there were other virtues on, on there. Uh, you know, I think that with the question that your question raises another question, which is, you know, is something a vice if there are really no consequences? You know, would overeating be bad if it didn't make anybody unhealthy? You know, and if we could just take a pill and and abolish it, um, 
you know, I, I doubt that, the, that, that it would be a vice in that circumstance, but I would turn that around and say, I think the things that connect us to one another, which in the past may have been certain needs, social needs that we had, um, uh, those drives are wonderful, and the connections that result are wonderful. And so um, to the extent that technology helps us to undermine those things and live without them, I'm not sure that life is better. You know, I think that that I would rather uh, have friends who cared about me who said, you know, gosh, do you really need a third drink or let me drive you home or something of that nature, and in whose eyes I wanted to uh, appear likable and virtuous, and, uh, and I, maybe that would be better than um, removing the need for those things.